Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ongoing Mastery, Presenting and Speaking, the podcast, the community, the irreverent sense of humor that you love to hear. <laughs> I'm Kirsten Rourke, and I'm Kelly Donovan Condren. And we are bringing you some talks today. We're going to pick up on stuff we talked about last week, which is the speaker friend, speaker family concept, and also uh, analysis of your talks of your performance and kind of the yeah. support that you need so Definitely. what does that look like for you kelly so, when you're getting speaker friends support when i'm getting support from speaker friends i will often know what i need help with so i will give them something specific to be looking for i'm not sure how this section is landing or am i speaking too fast or is my volume the right pitch for this room things that i can't assess for myself um, and it's useful to ask people who know what to look for speaker friends as opposed to random people you can just beg borrow steal to get into the room because they know how it feels both to be observing it and to be experiencing it. And so the feedback that they give you is useful. It's targeted, it's specific, and it's honest, right? Speaker friends know that there is no point in snowing you with how awesome yeah. something is if it isn't. Yeah, and, the, the blowing yeah. sunshine. Sorry. And, and because they're speakers, you know that they understand what they're talking about. You can trust the perspective you've just heard as being useful, coming from a place of information, observation, instead of a sort of clutching at straws. I need to say something, so I'll just say this. You know, yeah. I'll latch onto this tiniest detail and make it super important, um, which is sometimes what can happen when well-meaning people don't know how to give feedback. Right, they yeah. miss something big and they blow up something that's not that important. Um, so that's been a really useful part of the experience for me. Uh, how about how about for you, Kirsten? It's been it's been really nice. I mean, I I've, I've been part of my original speaker family goes back twenty years to when I started doing conferences in the learning and development world and the Adobe world, and I got to revisit my original speaker family this last week in Vegas and see, yeah. you know, Dr. Alan Partridge, Dr. Pooja Jasing, the original two that were like, I'm like, oh my God, we've known each other for 150 years. And, you know, we've got families, we've got people, we're, we're moving on and we're all still connected. And I got to sit with my, my buds and it was good. And what is nice is that I'm now, since I'm moving from the L&D world out to the larger speaker world, we've picked up Innovation Women, and oh. I've got Tim David's Get Speaking Gigs group. And I'm in both of those on Fridays, which is today. So I got to go from my speaker friends group number one to my speaker friends group number two. And the commonality that I'm discovering is that, you know, some you'll get feedback, by the way. I mean, you'll get feedback from speakers that you have to discount. That's not like, it's not like magically speakers automatically give the best feedback. It's that we will give feedback beyond that was great. Yeah. Because that was great is nice. It is. And I, I like hearing it, but it doesn't move the needle. It doesn't help you get, you know, get better in what you're doing. And it's always good if you can get to somebody who, who's been there and knows it and can give you the cr critique sandwich, the nice thing, the thing to work on, the nice thing you know, packaged up and handed to you so that you have something you can move forward on, but still feel like, you know, still feel like you're doing a good job. And or if it yeah. was great, they can be specific about why it was great. Mm. You know, just saying, oh, that was great. Doesn't give you useful information about what to build on. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, my question for you is, is that different coming from academia? I mean, as yes. you know, as a professor, I would imagine that you didn't, you didn't, you know, get with other professors and talk about your performance. It's more like the depth of your work and your students, but not as much of the stage work. Yes, yes. Although sometimes, uh, especially if you're in graduate school and attending conferences at that early professional stage, there will be some 
it's not called how to give a pan how to give a panel 101 but some kind of feedback because you are new here from more experienced folks context but for the most part no for the most part the information we get back about our performance comes via student evaluations where mm. they often need to be tempered with all kinds of other concerns and commentary about how one dresses or you know the the way that you choose to present a particular piece of material may or may not be about the material it might be about i had four midterms this week right mm -hmm. um so we don't get a whole lot of that we get some ongoing professional development in my current department we'll observe each other's classes but it's not directly performance based sometimes yeah. that'll come into it but it's mostly content yeah yeah i think it's a lot harder because certainly in the training world um you know as a freelancer that was doing technical training and instructional design we wouldn't really critique each other we'd more give each other survival tips and tricks and you know oh by the way in boston here's a secret place to park um you know that kind of stuff <laughs> but in what i find interesting is is speakers specifically um more than any group i've seen before except possibly the you know the extended dance troupe we would all support each other and all give each other feedback but we were also a troupe whereas yeah. that wasn't really something we did with other people whereas among speakers it's interesting because you don't give unsolicited you don't go up to somebody and go hey let me analyze your performance but if you're both speakers you might end up having a conversation with them and going, okay, so what hit, what didn't, what worked? And depending on how comfortable you are with that person or how much you want to, you could actually get into the meat of it. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting place. I got to send um, my video, you know, the my sample example of my TEDx to my speaking coach, Tim David, and he was lovely. He was like, there's a lot of gold here, which is a very polite way of going, mm, needs some work. <laughs> <laughs> but he also wasn't wrong in, the, you know, he's like, he, he identified the gold, but it was really, it was lovely being able to kind of have him come along and go, what about flipping this? What about that? Why are you doing this here? And then, yeah. you know, kind of thinking it through because you put a lot into this. I don't, I don't know anybody in the speaking world that is not doing it out of a sense of a personal drive to share and give and, and make the world a better place, even though, yes, it's a job. We want money. Hey, I like money. Pay me. <laughs> and it's a service. We're trying to move yeah. people. So I everybody I know has that same kind of passion about, oh, but I just really, you know, I want people to understand or see or hear or feel this thing. And whether yeah. it's, you know, about mobile development and e-learning or whether it's about how to handle grief, it's still, there's still the same driver underneath it. Yeah. And it's about connecting with your audience. doesn't matter what you're saying. The connection with the audience is the critical piece because without it, it doesn't matter what you're saying. You can't say anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, and that mission to connect. I'm going to actually give a specific shout out to ID Lance uh, because I brought this up in one of the two speaker groups today, which is if you are either a speaker or you're building classes or courses or webinars or what have you, it's very hard to get out of your own way. You know, we're all subject matter experts. It's hard to get out of our own heads and see our content from another perspective. And there is yeah. a group of people called instructional designers who literally design instruction and their job is to be an objective outside influence that can look and shape and, and adjust your content based on what your goals are, like looking at your objectives. So anytime like you want the content analysis or the structure or refining, or I want to hit these marks with my content, somebody with ID skills, you know, and ID Lance is great because they have a really broad range of instructional designers. So they kind of know what the community can offer and can kind yeah. of talk to you. Plus Parker and Andrea are wonderful, wonderful people and are really big hearted. So I want to make sure I share the love with them because they're, 
you know, when you find the people you like working with, you want everybody to know about them. It's like, exactly. check them out. They're great. <laughs> so um, since we're, I'm doing shout outs, I'm going to do one more. And I'm going to hold this card up. There we go. Jamika. Jamika Bingham. The Inspiration Station. <laughs> Jamika, you're taking me aside when I was doing my first TEDx this last weekend and taking my hand and giving me support and love and grace and saying, hey, the world is the world is where it's supposed to be for you. You're in the right space. I, it was incredibly gracious and kind and thank you. So I just want to shout that out because I was really, really lucky that my first TEDx was the TEDx Alif people out of Houston because mm -hmm. they are a wonderful group of people. They are lovely, big hearted, compassionate, and they really fed every one of us that was doing it. So, yeah. you know, I mean, we're up there and we're, we're doing it and there was cheers and claps and we're like, you got this. Um, so it was just a wonderful experience. So big, huge that shout out. So great. Yeah. That's, I was, that... I didn't know what to expect. Sure. Yeah. You know, I love that the day was, you didn't put it this way, but it sounds like the day was just sort of one big passing passing the love from speaker to speaker right we're going to be behind this person now we're going to add to that and be behind the next person we're going to add to yep. that and be behind the third person um and that that's just so generous and giving and um just affirming that's yeah i'm so happy for you yeah i'm i'm thrilled because coming into the you know the the larger world now since january um you know i I'm from my L and D bubble of speaking and now coming out into it, I'm discovering that it, at least in the TEDx universe, it looks like every single one is kind of its own unique personality, its own little kingdom. So you never really know what you're going to get till you start to get to know the different people, the different players involved. And I met Ade, who was the producer for this online because I found his online presence to be just so wonderful and amazing. And we had this great online conversation about dreams and vision and, you know, sharing the energy with people. And that was long, you know, that was before um, I got an opportunity. He invited me to, to, you know, to play. That was and in the summer. That, yeah. Yeah. It was really, I mean, I think it's hard to tell. It's all a big white blur now. It yeah. was sometime in this calendar year. <laughs> It was some time in this, but it's all been a big blur since January, and I'm very happy about it. So we, in this podcast, wanted to talk about, you know, speaker support and family and giving feedback. Um, it is hard to get feedback. Yeah. It's hard to give feedback. It it's harder to get it. And yeah, it, is. it is. So as a professional of giving feedback, I'm going to put you on the spot. How do you advise okay. people who are not used to giving feedback to start doing it? If someone asked me to give them feedback, I actually do this even as a seasoned professional. My first question is, what are you looking for? Sometimes people just want a general shout out. Sometimes people want really detailed feedback and giving the wrong sort is frustrating and kind of thwarts the purpose and the speaker looking for feedback is a little disgruntled and it's kind of hard to reset from that. So knowing as the feedback giver, knowing what the speaker is looking for will help you know where to focus your energy. You can't take notes on everything mm -mm. unless it's a one minute speech. But anything more than five minutes, you're going to have to choose what to pay attention to. And then I would, this is what I do with my students, I would suggest breaking out into performance and content so that you can make different kinds of notes. And again, depending on what the speaker is looking for, but if there's something that they don't know they need to know, you can make a note and tell them. You know, I saw some additional couple of things outside of what you asked for. Would you like to hear them? Right. Mm. Just because you've observed it doesn't mean you have to tell them about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
but you know some people don't know that their hands in and out of their pockets in and out of their pockets is really distracting they don't even know they're doing it um yep. or uh i teach college students many of them don't dress up all that to- all that much so when they are dressed up they're maybe in unfamiliar clothes and shoes and yeah they'll shift their weight and you know they'll fuss with the sleeves and whatever and they don't know they're doing it so you know i might have three categories physical performance content extras and and that way the feedback giver can can target more effectively and not try to cover every single base all the time those would be my first two big things what kind do you want and then bracketing different kinds so that as the speech performance goes on you can take notes in sort of different sections of your paper instead of just trying to keep a linear list top to bottom of the page right yeah yeah definitely i don't i i no longer wear bracelets because i would play with them yeah and they would always be Mm -hmm. you know picked up on microphone or also it was distracting and things like that um i will notice that it's hard I, i gotta say the best thing you can do is watch yourself on camera. It It's awful. It's horrible. Oh, it's no fun. It's terrible. No. It's terrible. We do not enjoy it. But noticing that you shift your weight back and forth or forward and back. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure I've told the story before about the the when I was doing my, my training and the younger kid, lovely, lovely guy, super smart, had his hands in his pockets and was rocking back and forth. And he had loose... Uh, I mean, this was a long time ago. He had sort of the 80s, 90s pants on and he had his hands in his pockets. So he was waving his crotch at us and we had to kind of go, um, that's not going to pick up well on camera <laughs> because it was this very distracting. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Um, and you never see this stuff because you don't no. you don't feel it. I would say the best thing that you can do is pick one thing you would like them to work on and two things that they did beautifully and mm-hmm. sandwich it. Um, because for me, I know I, I need to, I need to, I need to give grace to the fact that we're all doing ongoing mastery. We're all working on getting better and that takes time. And that means you can't work on everything at once. You know, you, you have and to. it takes vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and to, that's and that's yeah, hard. Vulnerability, openness, it's hard, and there's only so much of it you can do at once. And and the best thing, and we do this with our clients, is that you don't when you watch your own performance. Um, this is really really hard. The last pass, if you watch yourself more than once, the last pass, you need to only look for things you did well and make a note of at least three of them, because we never look yes. at our good. We never, ever look at our good. And you have to end on that because otherwise it's draining. It's hard to do this work. Mm -hmm. And if you, every single time you evaluate yourself are like, oh, these are the 12 things I need to fix. It's hard to keep the momentum going. So instead it's, okay, here's some things to work on. Here's things I might work on later if I have time and money. And here's things I did really well and end on that and walk away. So that's hard to do. The semester I was in the art room, so it had giant floor to ceiling glass pane windows. And in between those were giant floor to ceiling mirror panes. And there's a computer station in the classroom. I can't move it. It's bolted to the floor. So for the entire semester, I watched myself teach because I had to stand at the computer to show what I wanted to show. And therefore that's where the mirror was. And it was so, so distracting. And so that thing you just said about, okay, next class, I'm going to work on this one thing because I'm still trying to teach my class. I still need to get through this set of material while I'm also trying to do the brain processing of working on the one point, right? And so at the end of the class, I'd be like, did I do that better? Yes, I did. Good job, me. Okay, what's the next thing I'm going to work on? But that that live, so I didn't have a recording, but that live watching myself teach was a really formative experience. Uh, Informative, somewhat terrifying, but really useful. Yeah, at dance events, you know, you'd have the wall of mirrors 
and the instructor in front, and I would end up, you know, I'm assertive, I'd be one of the people in the front row. So I, obviously we needed to flip rows because the same group of us always ended up in the front and then the shy people always ended up in the back. So luckily in Middle Eastern dance, they do a lot of flipping the rows, which is great. And when you're up to where you can see the camera, uh, not the camera, sorry, the mirrors, it really helps because you're looking at the instructor and then you're looking at yourself and you're doing the same arms. No, you're really not. And you move your body and go, oh, wait a minute. They're do. oh, they're here. Even though it feels like they're here, they're here. And yeah. that feedback, that reciprocity that you get is kind of the same stuff that you can get by watching yourself. You can kind of go, I remember being really energetic here. It's not reading. Yeah. What could I do to make that read more? Maybe lean in a little bit more or gesture a little bit broader, or that's reading bigger than I intended. You know, so it's it's de- very much a, a performance evaluation, but just be kind to yourselves because <laughs> it's it's ongoing mastery. We're never done. You're no, never no. when you're done. You're that's it. Like it's over. So it's always. I still trip over my feet in the classroom. I'll turn too fast and mm-hmm. try to point at something and overbalance and kind of grasp onto the table right there. I think there's a running betting pool on which day it's going to be before I just absolutely twist my ankle. So, you know, I could understand myself in space a little bit better. Okay, but please don't hurt yourself. <laughs> please. I won't. Because, <laughs> okay. no, that would be bad. So that was what we wanted to come on today to talk about is just, you know, a little more about analysis and performance. Uh, you know, the value of finding people who understand the work that you do. And yeah. that doesn't mean they understand your topic. You know, speaker right. speaker friends don't necessarily have to understand your work in the, in the words to understand the art of what you're doing. So it's mm-hmm. always worth finding communities and the Innovation Women community and Tim, da- uh, Tim David's uh, Get Speaking Gigs communities are uh, every Friday. I, I love those. They feed my soul. So please come, come find us. We are on LinkedIn in Ongoing Mastery Presenting and Speaking, the group. And mm-hmm. let's give everybody a, a little homework assignment this time. Ooh, walkout music. What's our homework? In walkout, so walkout music. If you could, yeah. if you could pick pick a piece of music, you're walking out on stage. You're about to do. You're just. You are gonna go kick ass and take names. What is that song? Tell yeah. us in the chat. Tell us on the socials. Come into LinkedIn and let us know, Kelly. What is your What is your dream song? If any song you pick would absolutely nail it for people, what would that be? Uh. Dropkick Murphy's Queen of Suffolk County. I grew up in Boston. I am a Boston girl to my bones. And there is a group of friends that when they hear that song in any context, will immediately text me and tell me they've heard it. So uh, that would be my ideal walkout music. Yours? So if I wanted to really have it be like a wonderful edgy, you know, come on, come out, let's, let's have some serious energy. I'd have to pick something from the Pogues because that would just feed my soul. Though I will yeah. say that what I did this last week was I used Pentatonix. And the wonderful mm. thing about their music is that the vocal performances are diverse enough that you can find kind of anything. And I found something that was just a little, a little R&B, a little kind of, hey, let's come and party. Let's do this thing. And that fit yeah. exactly the right energy. So I would probably pick... Um, you know, pick something that had, oh God, I, you know, I think maybe Prince, like something that had the strong musical quality, but also the energy and just be coming out and going, okay, ready? Are we ready? Shall we dance? Let's do this. Cannot, cannot go wrong with Prince always. So everybody let us know what yours is. Again, uh, I did not pick specific music. So that will be my homework is to find a very specific song, not just an artist. Um, okay. And other than that, all right, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. We Cheers. <laughs>